Well, good evening. We're here again for Wednesday night prayer meeting, and our discussion tonight is going to be about Bibles, or the two streams of Bibles that have come down through history. As you see my picture here, it says God wants you in the Bible every day. But many times I'm asked the question, which Bible? And so I'm doing a 10-part series on, and, and understand, this isn't an intensive, this isn't an all-encompassing, this doesn't cover everything. I'm only touching bases about the primary understanding of how we got scriptures today. And there are two streams, uh, two streams of Bibles that we're going to look at, two streams of people that have promoted those Bibles, and we're going to look at the characters of everybody involved. Now, we do have many texts today that we we use, and my understanding to where I'm at now is that many of these texts are forgeries. And the, the, the discussion before this one, number one, was about money. And it basically went along the line that um, most money is based on gross domestic product, a gross national product of, of a country. A uh, good example is our, com uh, our country doesn't use gold anymore or silver. Uh, it uses gross national product, which means that the dollar bill, as we understand the dollar bill, is backed by the country because of the gross national product. Now, uh, counterfeit money is worth nothing. Absolutely nothing. And don't get me wrong, you can own counterfeit money. There's no law against owning it. There's only a law against transferring it. That means trying to get money for it when it's fake. And that's where it becomes illegal. It is, there is no power in the money that's counterfeit. It's worthless, basically. Well, when we look at Scripture, we see what God has given us, very plainly. And we know that Scripture is what God has given us. So, so we look at it from that standpoint. But during the, the uh, late 1800s, we started getting bombarded with a thousand different versions. As, now, it's interesting for me is that when I, I've done a lot of reading on the Jesuit family, and it's like at one time we only had one translation, and that was the Texas Receptus. And now we have thousands of different versions of not the Texas Receptus, but some versions they say that are older and better versions. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Older doesn't make better, it just makes older. And so as we go through this little bit of a study, uh, we can talk a little bit about the two streams. Uh, we're going to hold off on talking about specific uh, translations for now. Um, as I put the evidence together and I present it to you, uh, prayerfully you can see that, that it goes somewhere in the wrong direction. And uh, we should be looking very strongly at what God wants us to do with the, section, uh, the translations that he has for us. Uh, let's see if we can't get this thing moving. Oh, mm -hmm. All right. Now I'm going away for a little bit. All you're going to do is hear my voice as we go through these uh, texts. And maybe there's a little picture of me up in the corner. All right. Yeah, there it is. All right. So we're good. And so what we're looking at um, is the two streams that came down to us through history. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, let's see if we can get this to work. There it is. Now, our first stream is an Antiochian stream. That means that it came from Antioch of Syria. It was one of the very first places. If you see the quote there, it's from Acts 11.26. This is where uh, Christians were first called Christians. And Acts 11.26 says, And when he had heard and found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that the whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. This was also an interesting point when you think about it. Is that places like Antioch and Pela uh, were where the people migrated during the invasion in 70 AD when Rome came in and literally decimated or completely destroyed Jerusalem. The prophecy was they would, the gate would be left open. They would leave 
when they saw these things and none of them would be harmed. Well, all the Christians understood the prophecy. When they saw it, they all left. They went to cities like Pela. They went to Antioch. They went and they took scripture with them. So it, it wasn't left behind. And because they did this, God faithfully blessed them because shortly thereafter, the Romans came back and literally burnt Jerusalem to the ground. And so they saw that, they understood that, they took care of the scriptures as we see them today through the Texas Receptus. Now Antioch, if you can see where it's at, it's right there in Syria, just a little bit in that, that uh, left-hand corner, and below it is Israel. And they've still been fighting to this day, but that's not the point. The point is we need to see where Scripture went out from. Some of the oldest churches, you can see this was a pretty big, I want to say, edifice of some type. Uh, whether it's a church or not, um, it's beautiful from my standpoint looking at it. And, uh, of course, I think a good earthquake is going to put it on the ground. But, as I said, it's still a beautiful structure. I'm showing you these things because we have two streams of data coming out. Uh, one from, of course, Antioch, and the other is from Alexandria. Now, there's a lot to be said about Alexandria, uh, and, and even to this day. So, as we look at it, we just need to keep in mind that, that most of the pagan cultures, most of the uh, witchcraft and all the things, the divination, came out of Alexandria. That, that's where they came out of. Uh, any bit of history can show you and we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, library at Alexandria and, and the information that it was stored there and all of the rituals um, that were stored there that were eventually, well, burnt. It's interesting, this library was burnt down three times. So uh, the first time, and it's conjecture. They, they talk about three or four different people that could have done it. All that we know is it was done. It was destroyed. And, uh, of course, you know, my reading on it was, you know, the uh, first century Jews or Christians um, didn't like what was being stored there. Now, I don't, on this slide presentation, I don't have any pictures of the uh, incantation rites and what have you books. There are some that survived it. And they have actually have pictures of it in the, in the library itself. And I have pictures here somewhere uh, to dig out so that I can show you later if, you, if you're really interested in seeing them. But the point is, is that this was the pagan capital, pagan center of the world at the time. And some of those Christians, we call them Christians today, nominal Christians, were the priests of the time that literally just kind of flipped coats. Um, they stopped being pagan and became Christian. Does that mean they got rid of their pagan ways? Most likely not. And do we think they might have wanted to have changed Christianity a little bit? Oh yeah, I think so. Uh, because Christianity had something to say that the pagan religions didn't say. It says, no man cometh unto the Father except through the Son. That means no one could come to salvation unless it was through Jesus Christ. They had a real problem with this particular text. Now, the, the uh, library at Alexandria was supposed to have held over 50,000, 500,000, get it right, 500,000 thousand scrolls and the scrolls of course could have been on leather they could have been on uh, papyrus it could have been on any number of things um, but it was really important uh, for them to let's see where, where am I oh give me a moment there I am okay uh, 500,000 scrolls now that's a lot of scrolls that's a lot of information that's a lot of history about this part of the country. According to, according to the 500,000 scrolls, it had over 200 people that managed it. And if you notice up here, uh, you tell it's definitely that, that the uh, top of the um, that pedestal is a picture of Hathor, the goddess Hathor. You see it on all the temple, on the, all the pillars, on the tops of the pillars. I find it interesting uh, when you start looking at this stuff and you start seeing pictures of uh, what it was like in the day uh, that we see these things. Now, all of this information, all most of the storage was was ritual, pagan ritualistic ideals. I want to say uh, processes. Um, now, it's really what I find 
kind of um, different is that in 1988, UNESCO got involved with uh, the people in Alexandria to rebuild the, the temple or rebuild the library. The library was also a sort of temple. So, if, so if you got to equate the two. This picture that you see of this coin uh, sloping down is a picture of the library that's now at Alexandria. Now, you would think that they might have learned their lessons. It was burnt down three times before. Maybe, maybe something could come out of it. But uh, what do you think um, when they built the temple, it, it, and I find it interesting, is that if you'll notice on the outside, and I think I've left enough uh, of the picture here for you to see, all of these symbols on the outside of this temple or on, on the outside of this library are paganistic ritualistic symbols from all not not just from here from all over the world i'm sure that you can see them now some of them you may recognize uh, on the thing here but they are this is what they are their formulas their uh incantations their all kinds of things that were originally part of the uh, original library there because that's where they kept all that information about how you do things with other gods and unfortunately unfortunately uh, it was burned to the ground three times I can't imagine why but now they put it back on the structure it's interesting every single one of these you may have seen somewhere um, deal with calling other gods here's a close-up kind of interesting for those of you who've never seen this. Now what they say is the uh, patriarch of Alexandria, Theodosius, Theophilus, is also the patron saint of arsonists. What do you think about? That one's a good one. As Christianity slowly strangled the life out of classical culture of the 14th, 4th century, uh, it became more and more difficult to be a pagan. There stood in Alexandria the great temple of Serapis, uh, called the Seraphim. And attached to it was the great library of Alexandria, where all wisdom of ancients was preserved. I like the way they put that, ancients, but they don't tell you ancient what. They were the ancient pagan rituals that they were using to call their gods. Uh, if you go out to the uh, library today, uh, and you, you can click on it, you can actually see some of these incantations uh, still written in pa well, on parchment, what's left of it, uh, and you can actually see them and recognize what they are. It's not a, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that one out. Um, so it was important. Now, for us today, if we would have had this kind of knowledge, um, I think we'd probably been in a lot more trouble, but I think that the building techniques of the ancients would, be a, would have been in there, and that would have been interesting to, for any read. Uh, now, Theoph Theophilus uh, knew uh, as long as the knowledge existed, people would be less le inclined to believe the Bible. So he set about destroying the pagan temples. Ah, what sense that made, it didn't. But uh, the Seraphim uh, was a huge structure, high on a mound, and beyond the abilities of raging Christian fanatics to assault it. Well, unfortunately, second century, the Christians did assault it. Faced with this edifice, the patriarch sent word to Rome, and there... Emperor Theodosius the Great, who had ordered that paganism to be annihilated, so he's getting rid of it altogether, gave him permission to destroy this statue. Realizing he had no choice, the priests and the priestesses fled their temple, and the mob moved in. The vast structure was razed to its foundation. The scrolls from the library were burnt in huge pyres in the streets of Alexandria. And think about the money, the time, the effort, that, that those scrolls were actually worth at the time. Now, the scroll that we we're interested in is more than anything else is this one of the two streams from the Antiochian stream or the Alexandrian stream. So we only have two streams there. Uh, some other people would like to say there are others, but there are none. There are only two streams. And unfortunately, the second stream came out of the third century and not one of the main streams. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So this picture uh, depicts how we got, uh, it's a genealogy of, I hate to say te, uh, the King James, I really do, because it's the genealogy of the Texas Receptus is what it is. 
and the King James though is a beautiful language and it was well done. Uh, there are many aspects of their translations that are questionable uh, and we can talk about that. And so the Old Testament, the early wisdom literature, the blast plate of Laban in 600 BC, the books of Moses, they were all collected and edited probably about 1600 BCE, which is before the Christian era. And that means that they would have had to have been stored somewhere between 586 and 538 when they were in Babylonian exile, or they had them on them. Uh, the manuscripts collected and edited by Ezra, book of Moses structured. All of this was done before 300 BC, before the Christian era, that means before Christ, um, basically meaning that all this information was, was stored up. And you can find this being a truism because we have the Qumran text which pretty much established that. And we of course have the Greek Septuagint if you want to go down that road. Now there is a school, now all of the Old Testament and all came together by uh, 90 CE, Christian era. And I say that is because um, it's basically talking about the Jewish Old Testament. It's all structured and canonized by 9 CE. Then the Council of Gemini is one of the very first councils. Think about this post the destruction of Jerusalem. So they were actually part of, you know, um, making sure everything was in place. Um, they started the, the promulgating the correct text from the New Testament. And eventually, uh, we get what we have today but if you go down there you see Jerome's Vulgate uh, and which was a, a correct Vulgate because it was it came right out of the Texas Receptus or similar documents in the Greek and, the, and it's important for us to realize that and as we push down we have Wycliffe by now Wycliffe was the in 1333 he was the morning star of the Reformation that means he is the one that kicked the whole thing off yes I understand Luther and did a lot in his time yeah but both Wycliffe and Luther both lacked so much. And, you know, when we talk about Scripture, when we talk about progressive revelation, God knows that we can only handle so much information about anything at any one time. So what many times that you see happening, uh, especially through canon, is that little pieces are given to us. Little streams of light come down and allow us to get a better understanding of what God wants in our lives. Uh, and, and we see that very plainly uh, through Scripture, uh, through things migrating through Scripture, through us understanding what God wants. Uh, we, we talk about the, the New Covenant. Uh, we use the word testament, which is really not a good word to use because it's not uh, a correct word for Scripture. Uh, I don't remember in my studies in Greek that there was even a word testament in Scripture relating to what it relates to when it comes to the New Covenant based on what Jesus does in our hearts. And so as you see all of these texts, and we're going to talk about these a number of times just so that you can get used to it, get a better feel for them. Um, you, you know, we, we deal with the New Testament writings between 50, 52, well, I may say 49, um, 49 CE at 100 CE. And that means that everything in between was written by the apostles. And of course, the last apostle was John, and they say that he died well, they want to say 100, but I would probably say 96 or 97. Uh, but that's all, as I said, that's conjecture because we really don't know. We really don't. But the idea is that the Bibles or the Scripture has come out of these things. By the time it gets to Tyndale's Bible, there are a number of Bibles in place. The Coverdale Bible, the Geneva Bible, the Tyndale Bible. Um, they all have something to say specifically, but they are all out of one text. I want you to think about this. We're going to get to it get to the numbers here in a, in a second or three and, and I want you to realize that when we talk about the two streams of text it's important that we grasp the idea that one stream came directly from the apostles and unhindered straight down through history and the other stream did not the other stream was simply uh, the idea that somebody was going to uh, make their own copy translated I you know I have the comments and, and copies of the comments of all of these people that just did not like scripture, did not like God, did not like who he was, did not like what he said about paganism. Just literally, just literally they wanted to change the Bible so that it would suit them and what they were going to do. And that was to change the scripture. All right, so I, I'm now all this stuff that I put in here is for you. Uh, and, and I haven't put half the stuff that I could put in here. 
we, we try and keep these little studies to about 30, 40 minutes. Otherwise, there'll be two or three hours, and we can talk about a thousand different directions we can go with this, but we really don't. But in fact, Jack Mormon, who spent many years in researching the question of Bible verses, stated that the trans transmission of the Greek text of the New Testament is essentially a tale of two cities, Antioch and Alexandria. I want you to put your hands around that. So we have two streams that come out here. Uh, Dr. Mormon writes, just as surely as the King James text was woven into the spiritual life of Antioch and Syria. Now, I'm, I'm not going to uh, justify that. It's not the King James text. It would be more on the Greek text uh, that was dealing with this. So was the modern versions of the text in Alexandria. Today, a person must decide whether he is more comfortable with a Bible whose roots go back one or another to these two cities. Certainly, Antioch has by far the most glorious heritage, and it does. It has a heritage in which God had allowed it to do. So we read down, it said, Antioch was a springboard for the Gentile church. It became the center for the Gentile Christians, just as Jerusalem was for the Jews. Now remember, by this time, there is no more Jerusalem. It is gone completely. Uh, the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch, based on Acts 11, 26. Uh, Antioch was the uh, center of the outreach of the Apostle Paul and his missionary journeys. Many of his disciples also visited Antioch. It was the heartbeat of Christianity. Alexandria, on the other hand, and we have to think about this one for a second, uh, is a place where most modern texts and translations are originated. It had no such glory. It is true, however, Alexandria became the center of intellectualism. Such men as Clement and Oregon were active in this area. Now, we talk about these two rascals, um, and we'll try and speak well of them, but for the most part, there's really nothing to say that um, when you understand what Scripture is telling us that we could say about them. Uh, it's also noted as a place where every deviant sect was represented. Religious corruption and false doctrines were prevalent, including Gnosticism, Arianism, Paganism, uh, philosophy, etc. You know, it's all these things. Alexandria was the place where intellectuals of Christianity were attacked. Of course, if you can intellectualize it, you can attack it. And that's the way it works today. People try and intellectualize whether God or did not perform a miracle, whether he walked on water, whether Moses parted the sea, whether Genesis is even true. All of these people don't have a clue. I always, I have to be gentle uh, about so many things, but one of the things that we have come to terms with is that the Holy Spirit is the one who guides you. If you have rejected the Holy Spirit, then anything can be true. You see, the Holy Spirit leads us into truth. If we don't accept Him, then what more is there? Now, let's see. Uh, God has preserved His Word. He's preserved it in every generation. The Westminster Confession, 1646, say the Scriptures were immediately inspired of God and under His singular care and providence, kept pure in all ages. You hear me? The Bible has a final say in the matter. The word of the Lord is pure words. Now, this is Psalms 12, and he's going to preserve them for generation after generation. Now, these are his words, and I understand this. But when you have a forgery, something that somebody just sat down and wrote, there is no, as far as I can see, I don't care how close it comes to the word of God, there is no power in it. It's a forgery. It's like that money that's a forgery. It's worthless. I'm not saying that it won't change your life because, you know, the things that we read change us. But to do the real justice for Jesus Christ, to do the real justice for the Holy Spirit, you need to be reading the real thing that has been passed down from generation to generation to us. If we accept the inspiration of Scripture, we must also accept every word that has been passed down and preserved through the ages of the church. Both together are essential doctrines. As we look at this chart, oh, let me see if I can move my my smiling, shiny face. If it, I don't think it'll let me. Uh, there's uh, 29 original Testament books, and what we're looking at here is the corrupted stream. This is the corrupted stream. And you'll see that be about, you know, I want to say, 80 A.D. 
you see that the Vaticanus, now we're going to talk a little bit about this Vaticanus, the Synactus, and the Alexandrinus. Uh, they are all from a corrupt stream. Now I'm not corrupt stream. They're from a, uh, a stream that uh, we want to really have nothing to do with because, you know, uh, you can, if they were to copy something, that's one thing, you know, when you think about it. But these are forgeries, flat out forgeries. You, the, the Vaticanus, you can't, there's nothing before the 15th century. The synactic version has already been proven to be uh, written about the 1850s, not the third century, not even close. And so um, the lie is there. Now, you know, I say that very, very strongly. Um, if you say something to somebody long enough, hard enough, and cry enough about it, uh, it can become truth. I think that these, the people that... Uh, um, perpetrated this hoax have said it long enough that this is truly a Bible that is really old. Really, uh, we, we're going to talk about some of these interesting points that they know that it's not true. They've been caught with their pants down. and But as for us, they spent billions, well, millions and billions of dollars on promoting these all these new texts. Because they figure if they can flood the market with enough of them, they can do away with the Texas Receptus altogether. Now, you don't have to take my word for it. I'm working through all the quotes of all the, I want to say, the Jesuit brethren, um, those that claim to be Protestants who are really Jesuits. And, and all you have to do is listen to their words to recognize that behind this great forgery is the church, the Catholic Church. We're not going to mince words with it. It is the Catholic Church. It is the Jesuit army that's behind, the, the militant Jesuit army behind the Catholic Church. Something that we need to really consider because remember, they don't just attack from the front. An army attacks from the front, the side, the rear, above, below, any way that they can get in. This is one of Satan's greatest deceptions, that any Bible is okay, and it is not. And for those brethren out there that want to argue it, go find, go find another hat stand to put your hat on, because this isn't arguable to the point where if you start really pinning things down, it really upsets a lot of people, because I said this is a multi-billion dollar business. They are not going to give up what they have. So if you look here on this chart, you see the Vaticanus came around, actually came down a little bit later than this. Uh, then you have uh, Titian's uh, Diatessaron. They had destroyed thousands of copies of that because it was so corrupted. Uh, the Egyptian Coptic, Jerome's Latin. Now, it's interesting, Jerome's original Latin Vulgate was from the Texas Receptor, or from the original Greek. It was later revised and it was corrupted. I'm sorry, that's just what happens. Um, you have uh, Old Testament, New Testament, Doe version. Doe version is the Jesuit or Catholic version of it. But you want to think about this. Uh, down here at the bottom, and we're, we're going to talk about these Vatican versions here in a second. Uh, so this is what happened within the church. Paul recognized a problem in 2 Corinthians 2.17. We are not as many which would corrupt the word of God. They were already corrupting the word of God during his time. And so we see during the Pope's time, we see the Latin language dies. Pope forbids translation in any other language. Pope kills millions for owning a Bible during the Inquisition. Foreign Bibles do not show up until the 16th century. English and other translations only from Antioch. And all the new Catholic Bibles are the corrupt Alexandrian versions. Interesting. And we're going to talk about two of them, the Synactic and the Vaticanus. And so, and we have two very interesting gentlemen along this path and there uh, one is Westcott and one is Hort and uh, they were uh, supposed to be Protestant um, ministers uh, but they, they were far from Protestant ministers uh, they were as they were as Catholic Jesuit as you can get and you just have to listen to their words and I'll be quoting their words just for you uh, so so we look at the Vatican versions we have the revised version of 1881 well actually Revised Standard Version, oh, that's down there, 1952, not 54. Uh, uh, American Standard Version, 1901. Nestle Aland, 
uh, here we go with another group of uh, people that are really into the this text, uh, the Greek text. In fact, the, which you always ask which Greek text that they, they're using because if you can't and you're not, uh, they could be using any text and you're not aware of it. They could be using the Alexandrian. They could be using... Um, when I say the Alexandrian, I mean the Synactic or the Vaticanus version. Uh, you have the Revised Standard, you have the Amplified, the United Bible Society, you had New American Standard, the NIV, remember 1978. Uh, they were really uh, up in arms about it. In fact, they bought cases of these Bibles and they went down to a road called Furnace Creek. Uh, it's just, just a funny road. And they burnt the Bibles. Uh, so they were really upset about that, that 1978 version. Then you you have the New King James Version, 1982, the New CV, okay, that one stumped me, I'm sorry. And then you have, you have so many more after that. So you have over 300 plus new translations of the Bible, not based on the Texas Receptus, but this new stream that they decry as the... Uh, the, uh, I want to say, it, the cat's meow, uh, but it's not. This whole thing was a forgery to start with. And then they just simply kept on going with it. And now that they've had it out there and now that it's been working, it's just like, well, we're not changing it for you. you just accept it or reject it. Well, we reject it completely. Now, here we go. We have the two streams. This is one is purity, one is corruption. The one we just did was corruption. We talked about it a little bit. Um, so I guess you can see this a little bit better. And my face is still stuck in the top of it, so you're stuck with that. Uh, the death of John the Beloved, uh, the apostolic office ends. And they, they actually have it at 105. I pushed it down a few years, but, you know, it's just this the way I look at it. Um, the book of Acts, and, and the event, events of the book of Acts, 333 to th uh, 665 uh, AD. Now, not using Christian error is the Sanio Dominio. Um, so it's just a little bit different, and, but we'll move on from there. So 105, uh, John dies. Now, about 350, somewhere in there, um, they decided to go ahead and pull a copy of that. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later and see how that goes. And so you can see the dates at the bottom here. You had the Old Syrian, Old Latin, Old Gothic, Armenian, Ethiopic. Now, we're. I want to point out... Um, that there are over 6,000 different um, documents sent out to these different church groups, and every word is exactly the same, and all 6,000 are pretty close to it. You have the Armenian, the Ethiopic, the Gregorian, the Slavonic, uh, the Bohemian, the Second Slavonic, uh, Luther's German, and then eventually we had Erasmus's Greek New Testament, which was a compilation of all the... the the text and making sure that it was correct um, went to Luther's Bible authorized James now the 1611 authorized King James Bible uh, was not the first uh, version there was a couple revisions of it and then uh, the final revision was in 1769 um, so we have pure Bibles here we have the Tyndale the Matthews the Coverdale the Great Bible the Geneva Bible the Bishop's Bible then we have the King James Bible of 1611 I want to remind you that all of these Bibles all of them every single one of them What's important about them is the Greek behind them is exactly the same. Do you hear me? It is exactly the same. But when we look at the other side of the coin, I'll see if I can get back over to here. Uh, all of these were different versions, a different and different and different. All these ones down here, the Vatican versions, they're all based on this corrupt stream. And that's not going away. Now, here's... This is a combination of both. So you can actually see the timelines. You can see the histories. You can see how everything works together. But still, there's two streams here. You have the corrupt Alexandrian stream. This is the tale of two cities. And then you have the pure Antiochian stream, which comes directly from the apostles. Got it? Yeah, okay, you got it. Okay, we'll just make sure you got it. Okay. Now the critical text, the critical text follows a small handful of manuscripts in third, fourth, fifth centuries. These readings are not supported by less than ten manuscripts, and sometimes as few as a couple. So, so understand that uh, we always look for um, manuscripts that agree with each other, 
so that they can bundle them into one category. Uh, this is the text favored by Westcott and Hort, who took a humanistic vote uh, approach to reconstructing the New Testament. Now, these two rascals, I can talk a little bit about them. I've read their life stories. Um, we go down that path. Uh, they were as good uh, Catholic boys as you could ever want. I'm and not, not criticizing Catholicism, but that's exactly what they were. They had the same verbiage, the same texture. They talked just exactly like Jesuits. Uh, and uh, I'll be doing a comparison uh, on Westcott and Hort uh, later on uh, in part of the study, probably in, I think, 6 of 10, somewhere in there. So we have the Vaticanus and the Synactus. There it is right there. It says 331 A.D. They're both forgeries. You can't get the Vaticanus be, uh, before the 15th century. And you can't get the, the synactic version at all. And though they say it's this old. You know what's interesting about this text, the synactic text? Somebody got the wild idea that if they were to go ahead and do a carbon dating on it, that they could tell how old it was. Isn't that interesting? Well, something else came up, but we'll, we'll talk about the 2427, the copy of Mark. Um, but they're using that to text to, to say this is how this old this is because the texts are similar. Well, what's interesting about the synactic version is that when they went up to go and do the uh, test on it, somebody somewhere, I haven't been able to find out who or where, said no, don't. Because this is what they were going to find. The first thing that they were going to find is the stained pages of the synactic either coffee or tea based on the original historians that saw this document before before Trischendorf got a hold of it it was pure right I've got we've got the text we'll, we'll throw them out there a little bit and let you see them so we have the Vaticanus and we have the synactic version uh, and they're both forgeries on top of that they're both they're forgeries and so the synactic version it's interesting uh, is missing 16 books but it has all the books, books of the Apocrypha in there. Ooh, that's even makes it that makes it more fun, because if you accept the Synactic version or the Vaticanus version the way it is, in the translation that it is, there's no way that you cannot have to answer this one question or this one statement. Well, you you trust the Vaticanus or the Synactic. Where's the rest of the book? What do you mean? Well, there are books of the Apocrypha, or the pseudo-bibliographical books, they were attached to this. If you accept the Vaticanus and the Synactic, you should be accepting them, which opens a plethora of other really bad theology. Can't get away from it. You cannot get away from it. So Westcott and Hort assert the following. The older the manuscript, the better. No. That doesn't wash it in any way, shape, or form, and we'll show that later on down the road. It just means they're old. Older or not better, just old. Shorter readings are better. No, shorter readings are not better. Because sometimes you need something to be explained to you in the fullest context. Especially when you say, Christ died. And that's it. And it's not like Christ died, he shed his blood on the cross of Calvary for each one of us. That's the longer version. And that's what they're complaining about. The third is, Texas Receptus readings are longer and more recent and therefore corrupt. That does not mean that they're corrupt. It just means that they're justifying their own types of theology to go with them, and we do that ourselves. Uh, so we have to be careful with that. Nearly every Bible exception in the New King James has been translated into English since 1881 has followed the critical textual theories of Westcott and Hort. Two good Jesuit boys. Something to think about as you go down the road, because uh, so we've got so much more to go through. You have the Revised Standard Version, the American Standard Version, the Revised Standard, the American Standard, and the New International Version, the NIV. And this was all to make it so much simpler for us to get people in the church. Really. Forgeries. And that's going to help us get people in the church. Well, I've got this, and most people have seen this. I'm going to kind of pass through it because it yeah, there's a lot to it. talks about the, the mainstream traditional text. Now, if you look at the top here, it says over 5,837. That means that there's over 6,000 manuscripts that support the Texas Receptus or support the original Greek. Unfortunately, if you look at the top, 
there are only 45 manuscripts, if we're lucky, that support these other texts. And the corruptions were introduced in 150, 215 uh, between Clement and Oregon. And we have to think really hard about this because Clement, Oregon, Eusebius, uh, Jerome, all of these people were students of each other. And they believed, they did not believe the way the mainline Christians did. Now this is getting a little bit better. We have the traditional text line and we have, of course, over here, 45 manuscripts. Alexandria, I should, I should have changed the colors. The red should have been the bad ones and the blue should have been the good ones. I just kind of looked at that a little bit differently, I guess. Uh, if you look on the left-hand corner, you see the apostles, the original manuscripts, the Syrian, the old Latin, the papyri, the unscripted. Now you look over here, you'll see, yes, papyrus. And then what you see is translations from the individuals and what they thought the scriptures to say, including the Vaticanus. And of course, this is a modern version. If we read over here, accepted the Greek, Clement accepted the Greek philosophy and apocrypha as divinely authoritative. He was ahead of the uh, Catechical uh, School in Alexandria and believed that salvation could be obtained through various means, including baptism, faith, and works, and faith alone. Nah, I didn't believe in faith alone. If you if you believed in faith alone, you wouldn't believe in faith and works. Uh, he became the head of the organ, became head of the Catechical School and the man of superior intellect, however, he denied the Bible's historicity, uh, eternal punishment, the Holy Spirit. All these things are here for your, I'm going to say enjoyment, but for your edification. And so when we look at these things, we have to be very careful about them. So we have two false witnesses here, the Vaticanus, and I'm going to leave you to read the rest of this material, um, and the Synactic version. And both of them, both of them are forgeries. Let's see, uh, we are, yeah, it talks about it. Uh, the total of 43 manuscripts, some support this text compared to five, well, they have 5,210, which support the traditional text. Now, John Bergeron is probably one of the finest scholars. Um, he's written a number of really good books uh, or good documents. I think you can get them in PDF files out online, uh, it's, and it's pretty straightforward. Um, these are two of the least trustworthy documents in existence. He quotes it very, very plainly. Doesn't cut, you know, and cuts right to the chase. And understand that eventually these documents are flowing down with the Synactic Jerome's translation, the Alexandrinus, and then you have the Douay Reims version, uh, Reims Douay version of the Bible, which is is the Catholic or the Jesuit version of the Bible. It says something about um, Christ uh, that. The, they were trying to get away uh, through the Protestant Reformation, get through it with a document that said more to what the Catholic Church wanted than what Luther, and remember Luther was part of that Protestant Reformation, and uh, he produced the, the German Bible, and then from there you wound up with the Coverdale, the Tyndale, the Matthews, the Great Bible. All of these came out of Protestantism, Stephen's Greek, uh, the Geneva Bible, the Bishop, and I'll tell you what, be quite frank with you, uh, it, all of these Bibles, the text is on this red side, the bottom one it says King James Bible, have been rejected by everybody on the other side. And of course it talks about the two apostate revival, uh, uh, revisionists, revisionists, both were apostate. Westcourt did not accept Genesis 1-3, through 3, boldly uh, bodily resurrection of Christ. Man, he literally trashed it and when I say trashed it you should see some of the things and I'll you you'll be able to I'll be putting them out there for you um, so that you can see just exactly what kind of man this was that's translating the Bible and that that you are relying on many many of you are relying on to this day uh, you, you talk about the Greek New Testaments. These were distorted. Uh, Grissenbach, Lachman, uh, Tregelis, uh, Trischendorf, Alfred, all of these people every single one of them had distorted the scripture. And then you wind up with Westcott and Hort's Greek, and we don't even talk about those two Jesuit boys because we will talk about them later, um, including their inability to accept the infallibility of scripture. That means that basically that God has inspired it. Now, what's interesting is from Westcott and Hort's Greek, the Nestle Greek texts and the United Bible Society's Greek texts, all of these texts we now deal with. Now, you can't go to, normally you can't go to a Greek um Greek classes, because your Greek classes are Nestle Greek or, or uh, Westcott Hort Greek or United Society, the Bible Society's Greek. All of these are the same. 
And they all come from both the Synactic and the Vaticanus. So nothing is going to change. In fact, if you look at uh, down here, changes compared with the traditional text. Greek words, they added 306, they omitted 3,000. Think about that. Think about that, what that could say to anything in Protestantism uh, or what it could say about Christ and, and what, what he is doing. And so all these new revised corrupted versions, the American Standard Version, the Revised Standard Version, the JB, the LB, the TEV, the NEV, the NIV, the A, there's a whole list here including the Jehovah's Witness Bible. These are all problematic for all of us especially as pastors, you know, trying to do this work. Now, this is a copy of the oldest version of the Bible in the world is in the Sinai Bible housed in the British Museum. This is the synactic version. Now, this is not the original. The reason I know this is not the original because the synactic version had no cover plates on it. You notice this has cover plates on it unless somebody put them on after. It's missing as I said, 16 different books. There are over 14,800 difference between this Bible and the standard King James text. And I can say version, the King James text or the Textus Receptus. Why? It is here as a forgery to generate a split in the church. This was wisely devised by, now I can't prove it, so yeah, I'm just, pastor's just talking here. Uh, by the Catholic Jesuit family uh, to drive a wedge in it. Now understand, you know, we, we want to speak kindly of most of the people around us, but understand there are certain groups of people that do not think five years, ten years, fifty years down the road. They think of processes that happen in hundred year cycles. This is the way the Japanese and the Chinese think. And this is exactly the way the church thinks in hundred year cycles because they know eventually they know eventually that they will take control of everything around them. This is another page. Please remember I told you uh, this is a page from the uh, synactic version. As I said, if they were to test this, they would find that the Bellium isn't more than the year 1800 maybe. And that these stains that you see on here are not age stains. They're actually coffee, tea, or some other stains that they used when they when they made forgery forged documents back in the day and now look we can't say that the Catholic Church hasn't done this uh, because you had this forgery of the document of Constantine you had the 2427 document of Mark these are all documents that were forged documents that were true to the time and even though it was a lie they were accepted Still forgeries. When they came out, they were worth absolutely nothing. Well, that's the end of our prayer meeting tonight. I hope you all have got something out of it other than pastor just talking. Let me have prayer with you. We'll go on from there. Our Father, we thank you for all that you have done for us. We pray that you would guide us now, walk, walk with us, strengthen and keep us in all things. We pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you all for coming out.